Can you guys hear me? I know Margaret doesn't have sound. Mic check. Testing one, two, one, two. Eric, can you hear me? You have sound? Okay, anyway, yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> I don't know what happened. Uh, I saw you in the room, Eric. I was in the room. Seafeth was in the room. I saw you. And then I didn't see anyone else. I'm thinking, hmm, wait a minute. Is the room really on? So I decided to close and then open it again. And that's when you guys started coming in. So I'm sorry about that. Not sure what happened there with Pal Talk. Uh, let's see. I was just saying that the room became a ghost. I saw Eric in the room earlier, but when I didn't see Margaret or you come in, I figured maybe let me try to refresh the room. And apparently, I guess the room was uh, invisible, not showing that I was here. I don't have anything formal uh, planned for tonight. I want to look at, maybe just touch on some of the verses that I shared on Facebook about Solomon. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, and uh, hey, Thomas, welcome. I want to share some of these verses uh, again, and more specifically, uh, we want to look at the maybe the the one section of the one area that no one has really looked at. I think, uh, and that had to do with the the burial of Solomon. Now, the one thing I think we have to realize when we talk about whether or not Solomon was was a, a believer is that. <laughs> The one thing that we uh, we look at is the name Solomon. The name Solomon is Christ, isn't it? The name Solomon is Christ. Uh, let's see. The name Solomon means peace, and Christ is the Prince of Peace. So that, I think, is a very important clue. Uh, usually when God... Typically, when someone is unsaved, the, the name of the individual, I think, is often uh, used to reflect that. But Solomon is, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. She bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. That's the name Peace. So Solomon, I think, is a very a big spiritual type of Christ. And Christ is the Prince of Peace. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, in Isaiah 9, verse 6. So I don't think there's a, uh, any doubt that Solomon is used as a, uh, as a type of Christ in the Bible. Christ is our peace, we read in Ephesians 2, verse 14. Uh, and also, look at the similarity. Ecclesiastes 1.1, 1, 1, we read about the son of David. Solomon is the son of David. David was a type of Christ, so he represents God himself. He represents Christ. And Christ is also said to be the son of David. See that? In Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
So there, I think, is a uh, one important piece of information looking at the life of Solomon. First, I might as well post some of these verses since I have them. The very God of peace. So Solomon's name is intimately associated with Christ. And you mean to say that he was not a believer? He was not saved? What about Saul? Do you suppose uh, God had anything good to say about Saul? Can we look at the Bible and conclude? Yeah, it appears definitely that Saul was not a believer. Others may not be so easy to detect. Sono, hi, welcome to the room. Others may not be so easy to, uh, to detect. Uh, we know Cain was not saved because God is giving us that picture, I, I believe. Adam and Eve, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, the likelihood is that maybe they were saved. So we would have to look at more information there. What about, okay, so that's the name Solomon. The name Solomon means peace. And he is a type of Christ. Now, the wisdom of Solomon. Again, the Bible talks uh, repeatedly about the wisdom of the wicked, the wisdom of the church. Not that the church, you know, the church was wise as long as Christ was in the midst. Anyone disagree with that? 1 Kings 5 verse 12. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, and there was peace, that's Christ again, between Hiram and Solomon. Um, Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom, we also read in 2 Chronicles 9, 23, And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. Solomon is a tip, he typified the corporate church, the body of Christ. When the time, the time that Christ was uh, reigning in the body, Ecclesiastes 2, 9, I was great. And increased more in all, more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. My wisdom remained with me. And notice here, Christ is also said to have wisdom. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Okay, so can you see the parallel between Christ and the church? I'm sorry, between Christ and Solomon. Anyone disagree with that? The wisdom of Solomon represents, I believe, the wisdom of the church when Christ was ruling in the church. So Solomon is a type of Christ. Now, when the church comes into the Great Tribulation, what happened to the wisdom? What happened to the wisdom of the church in Tribulation? Hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, am I still on? Yeah, so what I'm offering here is that... Quicksand, hi, welcome is that Solomon is a type of, yeah, the wisdom of, yeah, exactly, Eric. In tribulation, the wisdom that belonged to the church, because Christ, yeah, Michael writes, God says he will take away even that he hath. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, well, we're having a discussion, Quicksand. Uh, we're looking at the life of Solomon in a uh, Bible study. Uh, after the study, we'll open the room for, uh, yeah, Solomon was holy. Uh, that's the, the question we're trying to raise here, is whether or not he was saved. Because there's been controversy surrounding the life of Solomon. 
He was not a Christian? How do you know that? Now, you, you came into the room a little bit uh, late, and I was offering, first of all, the name Solomon. Yeah, but please, you know, uh, hold on from posting. That's exactly why we're looking at these verses. Uh, we can't simply conclude, okay, Solomon had issues or... Uh, yeah, will you please look at the verses that I'm offering? Okay, now you're, you're offering me uh, your uh, understanding, perhaps, your interpretation, your observation. Okay, if you be patient, uh, I'm trying to explain, first of all, that the name Solomon means peace. And you came into the room late. The name Solomon means peace, and Christ is the peace. He is the Prince of Peace. So this means that Solomon, first of all, was a type or a picture of Christ. We're looking at the spiritual nature of the gospel here. Now, the and I also offered some verses regarding the wisdom of Solomon. The Bible says that Solomon was wise. The Bible says that Solomon was wise, and therefore he typified because he represents Christ spiritually, uh, we're looking at the wisdom of the church. And then now the church coming into the great tribulation, what happened? The church corrupts the, church corrupts the, the, the wisdom that was given to it. Uh, you're welcome to stay in the room. All right, but please refrain from posting, as I said. I want to share some verses. I want to offer some verses. You're welcome to look at them. Yeah, I didn't think you would stay. If people come into the room, you know, they, they, they want to go by their own agenda as opposed to being patient and then, you know, look at what's being offered. All right, anyway. So we're looking at the wisdom uh, of Solomon. Uh, let's see. Which was the last verse that I posted? Oh, yeah. Okay, now I want to take a look at the sins of Solomon. And this is why many people, you know, they tend to come to the conclusion that Solomon was not saved. Because, I mean, obviously, how is it possible that anyone with this kind of a lifestyle uh, would, be, uh, would be considered a, a believer? We read in 1 Kings 11, 2, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. The command was given to stay away from the heathen gods. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Solomon clave unto these in love. Nehemiah 13, 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, Sin by these, yet among many nations was there no king like him. Now, why do you suppose God said that? There was no king like Solomon, because Solomon is Christ. He is a type of Christ, and there's no one like Christ, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. When we look at the language here carefully, uh, let me post some uh, other verses. In 1 Kings 11, 11 1, King Solomon loved many strange women. Very important phrase, I believe. Strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites. So he violated the command that was given in 1 Kings 11 too. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. They will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So can you see how the church really, uh, this is a, a spiritual picture of what happens to the church in tribulation. In verse 8, 1 Kings 11, And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their God. 
um, Ezra chapter 10 verse 10 and Ezra the priest hey Gregory welcome stood up and said unto them ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel offering some verses we're looking at the life of Solomon and I'm offering some verses uh, some reasons why I believe most definitely that Solomon was saved he he was a type of Christ he is a believer he is a believer but yet because God used him as a, a type of the unsaved church the unsaved body especially looking at these verses all right look at Ezra chapter 10 verse 10 and also look at verse 11 now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives from the strange wives can you see that so this was the command God had always uh, commanded that the church be separate from the unsaved body and how was the church uh, supposed to obey this command anyone how was the church going to be faithful to the Word of God? When we look at the uh, the verse here in First uh, Kings eleven, ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. So how does the church violate this command spiritually? You know, it's interesting, uh, there are some that those that are offering God judging the church, they sometimes will agree that the church allowed unsaved pastors, unsaved people into the congregation. Do you suppose that that's a form of judgment? The church allows, yeah, the church allows unsaved people to multiply in the body and what happens when you have pastors that are not really uh, diligent in Bible study they're not really uh, looking to uh, be faithful to the whole counsel of God what happens well they begin to bring their own ideas right they begin to share things out of their own mind and so basically spiritually they become he they become a heathen nation they become unholy the church is holy corporately as long as Christ is in the midst but now we're looking at the spirit of Antichrist now the church corrupts the wisdom that belongs to it through the person of Christ so the church violates this command uh, number 16 21 separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Now, one thing I think, uh, Lord willing, you'll find interesting here is the language of what do you see here in this verse alone? Can anyone tell me? Number 16, 21. What are the two elements of the gospel that are in view here? Can you see why judgment judgment works uh, hand in hand? It goes together with the redemption of the body. Can you guys see that? What is the gospel? The gospel is judgment and salvation, correct? So Numbers chapter 16, separate yourselves. What does that remind you of? What does that remind you of? What comes to mind looking at this verse? Separation, right? Separation of wheat and tares. Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. So in order for God to judge the church, he is also going to redeem the church. 
He brings back the captivity of his people. Separate yourself. Come out of my people. He shall separate them one from the other. Matthew 25, verse 32. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So judgment and salvation. Now the reason God is judging the church is because the church has allowed the, the heathen, the strange women, the strange wives to come into the body. The same thing that happened to Solomon. Historically, marrying strange wives and coming across uh, in a manner that is uh, not consistent with God's command and therefore, judgment came to Solomon. Now, God allowed Solomon to be punished, but they called that Solomon lose his salvation? No, well, he had to have been saved, right? He had to have been saved. Nehemiah 13, 27. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil and to transgress against our God and marrying strange wives? These are the strange women. Strange wives, false prophets. False Christ coming in the name of Christ. They're not the people outside the church. So this, uh, Lord willing, should remind us again that God is mainly concerned with what's going on in the kingdom. Right? Proverbs 2.16 To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger, which flattereth with her lips. So let me ask you the question. When the Bible speaks of strange women, who, who is God talking about? Strange women. Babylon. Proverbs 6, verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Now here's another clue, I think. The tongue, because we speak with the tongue. And God uses this uh, figure, I believe, uh, the tongue, the mouth, the word of God, and the mouth of the false prophets. Now, here are some additional uh, wording, some additional language. Not the, the exact same language, but the same message, I believe, is in view. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What happened to Solomon? He first loved God, he is beloved of God, and then he, he leaves his first love. He goes after strange flesh, strange women. Ezekiel 28, verse 5, by thy great wisdom. Now, this is the wisdom of Antichrist. It was the wisdom of Christ. Christ was dwelling in the midst. He is a part of the corporate church. Wheat and tares are growing together. God is looking at the whole body as if it had been redeemed. God is looking at the whole body as the, as the body of Christ. And then we read in some verses, uh, those who do not remain, they don't abide in the, we read, for example, um, I am the vine, you are the branches, and the branches that are not bearing fruit, what happens to them? They are cut off, right? So that's the principle, I think, that's in view. Uh, by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. So now the church becomes Antichrist. Solomon becomes a type of the unsaved church. Ecclesiastes 1.18, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now this is a beautiful verse, I think. Uh, and many people, I, you know, they misunderstood this verse. And I did too. How many of you have looked at this verse? I know Family Radio used to talk about this verse, uh, that this is talking about a believer. I don't think a believer is in view here at all because the believer increasing wisdom does not increase sorrow. Christ is the wisdom of the church. 
But sorrow has to do with the church coming under the wrath of God. And so the more wisdom the church demonstrates, ungodly wisdom, the more judgment that comes on, on the body. He that increases sorrow, increase, I'm sorry, he that increases knowledge, increases sorrow. Ezekiel 28 verse 4, buy thy wisdom and thy wine. Oh, wait a minute, no. I'm sorry. Uh, and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches. And then one more verse in this category, Ezekiel 28, 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, how many of you have looked at this verse and then you're thinking, oh, well, this is talking about Satan. It's talking about Satan uh, ruling over mankind. And Satan was put out of the Garden of Eden. Well, the church spiritually has been put out of the Garden of Eden, right? Anyone disagree with that? Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? Looking at the life of Solomon, uh, you know, a couple of different areas in the Bible that when we put all this information together, I think there's only one solution, one conclusion we can we can come to, and that is Solomon was a type of the the church. Now, in this category, I've never even thought of it uh, as proof that Solomon was saved. How many people do you know of in the Bible? Well, before I even ask this question, why don't you tell me um, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, God did, of course, right? All scripture is given, is written of God. All scripture is, let's see, how did that verse go? I don't even have my Bible open here. One second. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, correction, instruction, and righteousness. But who penned the book of Ecclesiastes? And if we agree that this is this is the work of Solomon, we read in Ecclesiastes 1.1, the words of the preacher, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Israel. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. So let me ask you the question. Was Solomon saved? How many unsaved individuals that you know of in the Bible that God has allowed to write or pen his word in the Holy Canon. Saul did not write any books, did he? Moses wrote the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, what about Peter? First Peter, second Peter. Was Paul a child of God? At first he wasn't, but then he did become saved, correct? So who can you think of, who can you think of in the Bible that God is allowed to write parts of the Bible but were not actually saved? And yet the Bible says, holy men of, how does that go? Second Peter 1 21 for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost let me ask you the question again was Solomon saved
who do you know of that has written any parts of the Bible that were not saved? So I think the conclusion sometimes that people come to, uh, you know, too quickly is that they're not looking at all the evidence that the Bible has to offer. Yeah, Solomon, you know, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, said the preacher, all is vanity. So Solomon's words, now people say Solomon never repented. Can you believe that? You've heard that, right? Well, Solomon never repented of his sins. Is that true? Well, God does not give us uh, direct verses like uh, David, for example, looking at uh, Psalm 51. But the very fact that Solomon is writing the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, and he is talking about himself, that, I believe, is confession before God. I mean, look at the language carefully. Ecclesiastes 2.17. Therefore, Michael writes, that question was raised by someone on the open forum. Oh, and what was the outcome, Mike? I don't think I, uh, I caught that. What was the outcome? Therefore, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. Does this sound like God gave? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, if you ask uh, some of these, uh, you know, you know, the, these teachers that insist that somehow that, you know, they understand that Solomon was unsaved simply because they're just looking at the language. Yeah, I, I'm sure camping would probably dance around that question. Um, and if you ask uh, Chris also, you might not get a straight answer. Or you might get, you know, some answer that is maybe just, you know, trying to reason things out logically as opposed to looking at the evidence of the Bible. So, therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. Uh, I know Ecclesiastes 3.14, I'll just share some of these verses. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Does that sound like the words of someone who was unsaved? I don't, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but uh, I'm not aware. That's why I said if you know of anyone, don't hesitate to share. If you can think of anyone in the Bible, one of the writers, holy men of old, that God allowed to pin words, very important words, part of his book in the Bible, that would not have been saved. Yeah, again, that's like, uh, you know, looking at the glass half full. That's a partial answer, I think, Michael. That's not looking at everything. That's like coming to your own conclusion. That's exactly what they say when they read verses about Solomon going after, you know, going after strange flesh. Uh, they don't realize the severity of it is simply God is illustrating the how the church has corrupted itself and come under the wrath of God. Now the church, if we read that about the church, we would also conclude that the church was not saved. But yet God redeems the church, not the whole church, not the whole body. But God separates the wheat from the tares, and that's the redemption of, of the body. Now Solomon, having been a part of that body, <clears throat> I think he would have been redeemed. He is also uh, a part of, uh, you know, the those who come out of Babylon. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. Some of the lost, yeah. A wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. So I was great. I mean, this is the words of Solomon. It's the word of God. But God is using Solomon to write this information. And increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. So Solomon, first of all, he is a type of the church in its glorious form. When Solomon was first, when he was first made king, he received riches and wisdom and all of that because he is a type of the church. 
God is looking at the church as if the whole church was holy because Christ was dwelling in the midst. So the church had riches. Christ is said to be rich. Uh, the church has wisdom. However, we want to be careful when we look at the state of the church in tribulation. It's not the same wisdom. It becomes antichrist. It becomes their own wisdom, their own gospel, their own Christ. They're coming in the name of Christ. And so they're not bringing the wisdom of Christ, but rather their own wisdom. So in essence, what they've done is they've, they've, they've sold, the church has sold its birthright. The will, the wisdom is sold out to Satan. Ecclesiastes 8.12, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, that his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. So Solomon had this fear in him, I believe, when he realized the vanity of his own life. That, to me, is repentance. Verse 13, But it shall not be well with the wicked, so can you see how Solomon here uh, would be making a distinction between himself and the wicked? Now we're looking at the saved, the redeemed Solomon versus the unsaved body. Neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow because he feareth not before God. Rejoice, O young man, and thy youth. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So again, can you think of anyone in the Bible God allowed to be an author of the Bible and they were unsaved? Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You know, I don't think anyone really, Michael mentioned just now that this question was uh, brought up. I don't, uh, I'm not sure in what format, but if you really think about it, if you ask someone uh, who strongly believes this, well, ask him, well, who do you know in the Bible that wrote any part of the Bible that was unsaved? And there again, I don't think you will get... A direct answer. They'll probably dance around that question. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment uh, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, a couple of verses in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And we know that spiritually this is a, a love story, right? We read in verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointment, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Does this sound like the words of an unsaved man? An unsaved prophet? Okay, any questions? Now, I just want to share, you've seen these verses before, so I'll go ahead and put them up. Uh, if I'm going too fast, stop me. David, now God, you know, gives us verses regarding David, but that doesn't mean that, you know, he had to give us Solomon's uh, repentance in the same format, right, in the same fashion. Have mercy upon me, O God. You know, David committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba, committed murder. He killed Uriah the Hittite. But yet we read about his confession. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. So some people I think might be looking for an easy way out as far as you know, coming up well, with the reasons why they think Solomon is not, was not saved. And here's the last verse there, Psalm 51. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, now for the, looking at the final section here, and I, I mentioned uh, once before, I did have some additional verses, but 
we'll just look at a couple of verses and try to answer the question uh, regarding burial. Now we know burial, depending on the context, God uses that as a type of salvation, a figure of salvation. Romans 6, 4, we are buried with him by baptism into death. But there's also a burial that is not unto salvation. Anyone know what that is? Matthew 8, 22, but Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. And I think the reason Christ said this is because he knows spiritually burial is pointing to salvation. If someone is buried by God, then they are properly buried. What happens if someone is buried by Antichrist? Can you think of a verse in the Bible that would illustrate that? Can you think of anything in the Bible? What about Revelation chapter 11 verse 10? Do you think this uh, would relate somehow? And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, shall send gifts one to another. One to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. What is the idea of sending gifts one to another? What is that? Here's another one, which I didn't have here. That probably I should make that part of it. Uh, remember this verse, Hosea chapter nine, verse six. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. To be gathered is also salvation. Burial is a type of salvation. So what happens when Memphis is burying its dead? Well, let the dead bury their dead. So in other words, they are providing a false assurance of salvation. They're coming in the name of Christ. They're saying peace, peace and safety. And they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them. So the time when the church was under the judgment of God in tribulation, they're coming looking like Christ, they're saying peace and safety. In other words, they're sharing their own gospel, they're, they're offering their own Christ. And then God transitions the tribulation into separation and judgment. Thorns shall be in their tabernacle. Uh, let me see. Let me put that up here before I forget. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me wait. Hosea chapter 9, verse 6. All right, any questions? So David slept. Now we're looking at burial to see if uh, we might pick up some clues as to whether or not Solomon is uh, was saved. Now, I think all we have to do is look at the language surrounding the death and burial of any king of Israel. David, we know, was a child of God. He slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. What about Solomon? Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. You see that? God did not have anything negative to say about Solomon as far as his burial. What about Hezekiah? And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and true and truth before the Lord his God. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers and was buried in the chiefest of the sepulchers of the sons of David.
What about 1 Kings 13.31? Bury me in a sepulcher. Now, it's important where one is buried, really, because the whole Bible is the Word of God. And burial is looking at another form of salvation. Either God is burying the believers unto Christ, unto salvation, or the unsaved in a body, they bury each other. They send gifts one to another. So they provide they provide a false assurance of salvation. Bobby, hi, welcome to the room. Uh, let's see. Genesis 50, verse 25. And Joseph took an oath, the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So there was a very big concern, I believe, in how someone was buried. It's not simply, okay, well, you're dead. Uh, we just, let's just go ahead and bury him or her, uh, and that's the end of it. No. And Joseph was concerned that his bones be not left in Egypt. Why? Because Egypt is spiritually pointing to the, to what? To Babylon, right? The unsaved body, the unsaved church. And Joseph, and that's the fact that his bones is not left in Egypt, is salvation. Because bones in the Bible can also be used to identify uh, with people. Okay, now take a look at a couple of verses here looking at the opposite of the good kings, right? Second Chronicles 21, 20. Uh, 30 and 2 years old was he, that's Jehoram, when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem 8 years, and departed without being desired. You see the difference? Howbeit they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulcher of the kings. Isn't that interesting? Don't you think that if God knew that Solomon was not saved, he was not a believer? God, I, I, I suspect he would have put language to that effect because he does that with the others. To highlight or to underscore the fact that this individual was not a believer. Second Chronicles 28-27 It has slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city even in Jerusalem but they brought him not into the sepulcher of the kings of Israel. Now, the, the, the contrast here, I believe, is because, you know, the, they die. At, obviously, you're not going to go outside the, uh, the one place where everyone is buried in the city. So there's probably one uh, central location. But yet, at the same time, God seems to be making a distinction. There's a section, perhaps, of the... Uh, of the cemetery where only the uh, that is reserved for the the good kings of Israel, right? The people of God. All right, and then the final verse in uh, verse 25, Second Chronicles 24. Uh, looking at the the latter part of the verse, and they buried him in a city of David. Let me go back. Let me read the whole thing. When they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the, for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulcher of the kings. So in other words, he was buried by the dead. The dead bury the dead. That's a form of judgment. Okay, so the conclusion that I can offer here, and it is always subject to correction, Lord willing, is that when we look at everything the Bible has to say about Solomon, there it is. Even though God, he got into trouble, uh, more trouble than David, God used them as a type of the church. But yet, even with the church, the fall of the church, the whole church falls in tribulation. 
So the fall of Solomon is a picture of the fall of the corporate church, but the corporate church is redeemed from Babylon. And that's why I think we can read of the confession of David as well as Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesia, yeah, I think you're correct there. That the root word is where the church, uh, the word church comes from. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, any questions? Let me uh, let me turn off the recorder.